Welcome to Libraries Today. This program is intended to recognize and highlight the unexpected ways local libraries serve their communities today. I'm your host, Stan Howe. One of the most important jobs for a public library is to provide diverse programming for its community. These library programs offer the practical information people need to improve their quality of life and to increase individual options in a complex society. Information about health, education, business, child care, computers, the environment, taxes, job searches, and much more. Libraries also give their communities something less tangible, yet just as essential to a satisfying and productive life. Programs in the humanities and the arts that encourage people to think and talk about ethics and values, history, art, and poetry, all integral to the library's mission. Sometimes it's just about fun. Libraries are community builders and community centers and places for people of all ages to learn and grow. And all of it starts with the kinds of programs a library offers. In today's show, we drop by one West Virginia library that specializes in diverse, varied programming, the Raleigh County Public Library in Beckley. Let's pay a visit. I'm here at the Raleigh County Public Library in Beckley, and with me is Library Director Amy Stover. Thank Amy, you. thanks for being with us. Thanks for coming to see us. Uh, so, tell me about what you feel the library's role is in the community. The library is here to support the community in whatever way that we can. We're here for the community and because of the community, so they have to be our first priority for everything. Of course, programming is going to play a huge role in what you do offer the community. Absolutely. Tell me about some of your programs. Programming is one of our biggest focuses here in Raleigh County. It's Southern West Virginia. There's not a lot going on, mm -hmm. so we try to be a little bit of something for everyone. Um, for our children, we have upwards of 10 programs a week, ranging from sing and sign, all the way to slime time, mm -hmm. story time, and even Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> How important do you feel the programming is? It is our largest focus, it takes up a significant part of our budget, and it is what we are known for. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the programs. Uh, let's start with children's programming. You mentioned a couple of them. Mm -hmm. What are the programs that you have specifically for kids? Specifically, we start for our six weeks up to three years of age with Sing and Sign. Every week we teach baby sign language through songs, stories, and games. And we follow that up on Wednesdays with a story time for the three to six year olds. And every Wednesday night, we have Dungeons and Dragons for everyone from age six all the way up to 60. <laughs> and one of the ones, uh, I've I, I read a little bit about some of your programming, mm -hmm. and, uh, you meant, and you mentioned this with Slime Time. So tell me about the house. Slime Time grew out of what is now a global fascination with the sticky and the gross. <laughs> And every month we have Saturday Slime Time where the kids come in and basically attend a glue academy and learn how to make a different recipe of slime. We have done everything from scented slime to shamrock slime and even snowman slime. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a uh, program called, is it Crafternoons? Saturday Crafternoons. Kids who are in school during the week and can't attend other programs in the evening due to family commitments or school commitments, we want them to have something too. So every Saturday we offer a unique activity for anyone who wants to come. American Girl? American Girl. <laughs> we offer this program twice a year. We do both a historical doll and a Girl of the Year doll to kind of give the children here an idea of what life was like in another part of the country or even in another time period. Now for teens you have to have I would suppose slightly different kinds of programming. You mentioned the, I think, uh, game night and D&D. We do. We have a monthly game night which grew out of the Pokemon Go f craze of a couple of years ago. And Super Smash Brothers has been huge. There's nothing like competition to get the blood pumping. And we also have an anime club for our teens as well as they have their own D&D subsection. Summer reading would impact, I think, students of all ages. It impacts everyone of all ages. We don't just offer story time in the summer in a summer reading program. We have it for children, we have it for babies, we have it for teens, and we have it for adults. One of the things I've read about uh, summer programming, uh, summer reading programs, mm -hmm. is that kids who take part 
really have a big advantage in school the following fall. They do. What happens during the summer is if a child doesn't read during the summer, they don't retain the same reading level they left the class at, they start behind. If they read just six books during the summer, they're going to start out school fresh and ready to go where they left off. And we try to make sure that happens. Now we've talked about kids programming, teens programming. What about adults? Adults, while a difficult program to get people to come to, we're very lucky that um, our murder mystery nights are hugely popular. We have a very strong book club. We also have a historical society, a cartography club, uh, the tax service, of course, and just about anything you can name from proctoring of tests to just help with your resume. Right. Now, this is the time of the year you mentioned tax assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, uh, we're discussing all this as we sit here in the month of March. Uh, tell me about the program you have for tax assistance. We work with AARP to make sure that seniors who need help with their taxes get it, especially this year with all the changes. We want to make sure that there's no one who feels like they can't file their taxes just because they don't understand what's going on. We're sitting here in the middle of the genealogy section of yes. the library, uh, and with the advent of programs like Ancestry.com, that has become a big focus for a lot of folks. What part does the library play in all that? The library's role has always been an interesting one. We're not just here to let you explore the present or get you ready for the future. We're here to preserve the past as well. And the room we're sitting in now has been the work of decades, people exploring their own family genealogies and willing to write it down and share with the next generation coming. So we're very lucky to host the Fayette Raleigh County Genealogical Society's collections here. You mentioned uh, cartography. Yes. Uh, I, I was assume it has to do with maps. <laughs> it does. Um, there is a large section of our historical society that is very fascinated with maps, especially West Virginia maps. And they come together every other month to share a new find or explore an old favorite. What's the biggest adult program that you have here? The largest is definitely our murder mystery nights. We have 50 to 60 people pay to come to those. Wow. And our staff, each of them takes a role puts on a lovely performance, gets everyone laughing and practically falling off their chairs as they try to solve a mystery. Wow, so it's not only a fun program for the community, it's something raising money for the library. It fundraises for us, yes it does. What kind of money do you charge? We charge $10 a head and that covers a full meal and two hours of entertainment. So what does it work? So you have a murder of some sort and mm -hmm. then, then the crowd has to figure it out? That That's right, the way, what, the way it works is we have, the one coming up is called Murder at the 1980s Prom. <laughs> so if you can imagine the hair and the clothes of that year, my staff will all be decked out in the glory of the <laughs> 1980s as we try to solve who murdered the prom king. Uh, so as you look at all these programs, and you have listed quite a few, it's a very impressive list, mm -hmm. uh, what inspires you the most when you look through all the programs that you offer? Just the look on someone's face when they're shocked at how fun a trip to the library was. That's what inspires me. It brings me back even though I'm exhausted and I swear at the end of every murder mystery <laughs> or at the end of American Girl Party that I'm not going to do it again. A couple of months later, there I am doing it again. <laughs> what do you want kids and parents to take away from the program you offer? I want them to take away the fact that the library is here to connect them with the world. We're here to connect them not just with their past or their mother's favorite books from when she was a child or the newest technology on a computer or a tablet. We're here to connect them to each other and to kind of be a gateway to the future. How has the library programming changed over the years? I, I would think my experience you know, 30 years ago, libraries didn't strike me as being as fun as this one appears to be. <laughs> I think in the past it was very focused. There's always been story time in libraries, but that only gets you children up to, if you're lucky, the age 9, 10, 11, but you want the children to keep coming back. And if you want the children here, you want their parents here too. So you have to grow, you have to evolve, you have to find out what your community wants and see if you can deliver it. Thanks, Amy. We have a lot more to talk about. Yes. And we'll talk about more of all the happenings here at the Raleigh County Public Library right after this. County Public Library has a 
lot of interesting programs. And with me now to talk about, I think, one of the most interesting programs is librarian Carrie Burns. Carrie, thanks for being with us. And thank you for having me. So let's talk about Dungeons and Dragons. And you have, uh, tell me about the program you do here at the library about D&D. Um, Dungeons and Dragons is a tabletop role-playing game um, and originated in 1974, so it's had its fair share of changes and updates throughout the years. Um, I've played since I was younger, so I thought of the idea to kind of bring more teens in here since we don't have as many teen programs. I decided to start a Dungeons and Dragons group to kind of see how many different people I could get in here, people of all ages, backgrounds, stuff like that. Um, and with Dungeons and Dragons, it's done a lot for our library. We have almost 40 people in here every week, including all the parents and kids that come to our event. Um, we have our children's group with a DM, and then our young adult adult group with a DM on you know separate sides of the library. A DM is a dungeon master. A dungeon master, yes. And what does the dungeon master do? The dungeon master is pretty much your judge, jury, and executioner. <laughs> they serve as a referee. They control the world around you. Emit through this fire, this ball of fire energy, and. Shot. They also enact what we call NPCs, the non-player characters, which are, are people you um, encounter within the game. So they kind of control the interaction as well as your dice rolls control everything you do with the seven set of polyhedral dice that you use within the game. So your D20 is pretty much your, uh, hmm. your kryptonite. <laughs> well, part of the game is dressing up. Mm -hmm. So uh, how many of the kids do that? Um, we have kids and adults to dress up, actually. I have quite a few kids that love to dress up as their warrior character, their shaman, their completely stab, swords, you name it. Um, our adults, we have one that'll dress up like a dragon every once in a while. He's got necromancer cloaks, I mean, you name it. These people come from all different walks of life, and it's cool to see what different people bring in the library. I feel like it gives the kids and adults a sense of identity to kind of step out of their comfort zone and really be themselves in an environment where pretty much anything goes. <laughs> What's the reaction been from the kids and adults that take part? Um, they love it. I mean, it's really, a lot of our Shire players, our you know, less outgoing kids, have really come out of their shell. Um, it, Dungeons and Dragons teaches you to be more outspoken. It helps with um, debating in situations, like instead of arguing, you're kind of having to work with your teammates to work through problems. Um, for adults and children, it teaches a lot of critical thinking, problem solving, mathematics with the dice rolls, I mean, you name it. <laughs> another another uh, program you guys use, uh, it's not exactly Dungeons and Dragons, it's Game Night. Mm -hmm. So tell me about game night. We have a gaming club that meets usually the first Monday of every month. Um, we have had different themed gaming nights. Our first one was like a retro gaming night where we did a Super Nintendo night. We've had um, a Nintendo Switch night where we came in and um, they played different Nintendo Switch games. Everybody ended up staying on Super Smash Brothers though. Um, we've had Mario Kart tournaments. We've had Super Smash Brothers tournaments. And our most recent one was a Nintendo Labo night, which is kind of like ties in with like the STEAM, like um, science, technology, mm -hmm. engineering, arts, and math. It's a uh, cardboard kit that you build um, different items to go along with your Nintendo Switch. And it has like all sorts of different games with it, from fishing to circuit racing to you name it. <laughs> and it's all designed to get more kids, more teens, more people mm -hmm. into the library. Yeah, our main goal is to reach out to our, our community as best as we can. Um, like we've had, we also partner with our comic book shops and stuff like that around here. Um, we have had, for our Dungeons and Dragons, we went up to Dragon's Den up here, our local comic shop, and we did a paint night where they got to pick out their own miniature figurines that they use in Dungeons and Dragons, and they also got to paint them. We had a how-to painting session up there with some of the guys that work in the comic shop. So we like to partner with different members of the community doing different stuff like that because the outreach is just incredible. You get so many people that are like, oh, I didn't know the library had all this, and it's just so nice to hear, well, you know, I'm going to start Coming now. <laughs> and I understand you also uh, are involved with uh, Lego programs. Yes. 
We do Lego night every Thursday from 3 to 6. Um, every once in a while we'll have like a theme they can build around. Like most recently we did Dr. Seuss's birthday the week of uh, March 2nd. And we had them build something Dr. Seuss themed. And at the end of the week we picked a winner and they got like a small Lego set. We do that usually about once or twice a month. But we do the Lego night every Thursday. So we have quite a few kids come in for it. The creations they build are absolutely fantastic. Which one would you say is the most popular program of the ones we've been talking about? Um, probably our Dungeons and Dragons. Our gaming night gets very large when we have tournaments because everybody, you know, wants to test their skills. But the Dungeons and Dragons, where it's open to so many different ages, so many different types of people, it creates just more of like a nurturing environment to kind of grow, make friends, I mean, test your skills and just all sorts of different things. So I feel like the Dungeons and Dragons has been our most successful out of everything that we've tried so far. And uh, we've been doing it since um, December 2017. So it's been around a little while. <laughs> I'm just very glad to be involved in something like this and something that means so much to me that I've played since I was younger can mean so much to so many other people. Do you consider these, these programs pretty important to the community? Yes, I would consider these very important. I mean, a lot of kids, like some people don't even have internet at home, which I mean, in nowadays that's kind of hard to believe, but half the population of the world actually doesn't even have internet access. So coming to the library can give kids an outlet from the toys we have to our book selection, to our computers, which have tons of different learning games on them, as well as our activities from the Lego night, or story times, the Dungeons and Dragons. So we try to offer a little bit of everything for everyone to get all sorts of different people in here. Carrie, thanks for the time. Thank you so much. We're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back after this. Welcome to understood.org a free online resource for parents of kids with learning and attention issues with personalized recommendations, tools, and expert advice. Back here at the Raleigh County Public Library where we're talking about programming, and with me now is librarian Beth Mills. Beth, thanks for being with us. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about Dungeon and Dragons, we've talked about Game Night, uh, your specialty Comic books. Yep. <laughs> so talk to me about the comic books here at the Raleigh County Public Library. Well, we've got a really good collection. I think the only people we're second to in the state would probably be Parkersburg, if we're even second to them. Because we've got, um, I'd say, three different collections. We've got um, the adult and young adult graphic novels, mm -hmm. which are like, you know, your Batman and stuff like that. Then we have um, the manga section, which is like the Japanese comic books that you read instead of going from left to right like we do, you know, in America, they actually read from right to left. I have seen those and those are hard to read. Yeah, well, once you get the hang of it, it's actually, they're so fun. And um, it, you know, that's what I love about the library. When I was a kid, I couldn't, you know, afford those. And I started reading them when I started working here and kids just love them. And that's the great thing about comic books to me is that a lot of kids with reading comprehension issues, they love them. So it's, and it helps them read better, you know? <laughs> One of the big changes I noticed from when I was a kid, mm -hmm. many years ago in libraries, they didn't have comic books and graphic novels actually didn't exist when I was a kid. Yeah. They were comic books and libraries did not have those. Yeah. To me, that's a huge change yeah. to get kids to come in. Yeah, um, the thing is, I think the reason that they didn't used to be in and why now they're coming around, people are coming around to the idea that they actually are real literature. They have important stories to tell. Like, I mean, Persopolis, you know, about a girl in the Middle East. Um, Mouse is about the Holocaust. They have good stories to tell, and I think people are finally learning that. So we're getting them more in, and as we are getting more in, it's stuff that kids enjoy anyway. So it's telling them a good story, and it's helping them read better. So. <laughs> well, one of the things that ties in with comic books here in the library mm -hmm. is the Anime Club. Yes. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about that. It's so fun. The kids are, they, we have great kids that come. We have great kids anyway, but um, <laughs> we have great ones that come to it. Um, we've got our regulars, and every now and then we have a, a new kid or two. What we do, we just like to show them, you know, a couple episodes from an anime every, every time they come. We do it once a week. It's usually the third Thursday of the month. 
and we just show maybe three or four episodes depending on if we get started on time. <laughs> and then we like to do a craft with them that ties in with the show. Like we did um, dog ears for this um, show Inuyasha, which is about a dog demon trying to <laughs> slay other demons. Actually, Carrie has a pair of them over there. <laughs> um, and um, we usually have snacks for them. And honestly, I'd like to say that we, you know, have le long, lengthy discussions <laughs> and break down the animes, but the kids really mostly like to talk to each other and do the craft and eat. But as long as they're having fun and they're coming to the library, that's what's important to me. <laughs> Shifting gears for mm -hmm. just a second. Mm -hmm. uh, you also handle uh, women's programming here. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, we are speaking here in March, which is Women's History Month. Yes. Um, this month we are, and this is the first time we're doing it, I'm hoping to make it an annual thing. <laughs> we're actually collecting donations for the Women's Resource Center um, because I'm hoping to make um, what's called go bags, which is like, you know, a pair of socks, um, lady necessities, toiletries in a bag. So, you know, if they just need to grab it and go, they've got it all there together. And, um, you know, I'm very much all about women's empowerment and, <laughs> of course, being a woman, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Beth, thanks so much for spending some time with no us problem. and uh, talking to us about this great array of programming you have here at the Raleigh Thank County you. Public <laughs> Library. And we all have more from the Raleigh County Public Library and more on programming from here right after this. It takes less than one minute to find out if you may have prediabetes, and you can do it here. So what are you waiting for? Just go to the site. Back here in Beckley with the director of the Raleigh County Public Library, Amy Stover. Amy, you uh, actually oversee two branch libraries in Shady Spring and Sophia. I do, and we count our bookmobile as a third branch. <laughs> well, tell me about them. It's a wonderful thing to have multiple branches that every community can feel like they have their own library to go to. And it's great to have that, but it's hard being so separated from them on a daily basis. I think you mentioned to me earlier that uh, and Sophia was actually there before the building we're in now had been established. That's true. Sophia was the first branch put up in Raleigh County, and it was meant to be one of those temporary carousel libraries but here we are, 40-some years later, it's still standing. <laughs> and when did Shady Spring come around? Shady Spring was our last branch that opened. It opened in 1980. So how do the libraries interact with each other? Our libraries, we're all very close. We talk on the phone, we email, we have monthly meetings all together. And what we say is we're one library in many locations. How often are you able to get out to the branches? I run Courier on occasion, and we run Courier twice a week because what belongs to one library belongs to all the libraries. So our patrons can request something that's at Shady and within two days have it over here at Beckley. I do that. We have a meeting on the first Friday of each month, and like I said, we email and talk almost every day. <laughs> so do the branch managers tend to come here more often, or do you tend to get out there? It's about equal um, when you count the courier, because I go to them on those days. For the meetings, we have them here because we have a larger meeting space. What are the difficulties you run into when you're dealing with branches? The hardest difficulty is understanding that not every branch can be the same size or have the same staff or the same hours as another branch. Every community has its own needs, and you try to get the best that you can for that community with the budget you have. I suppose there are pros and cons to uh, overseeing three libraries as opposed to just overseeing, say, one library. Uh, what kind of pros and cons do you run into? The pro is we can specialize in different areas in different communities. There might be more inspirational fiction at our Sophia branch or a different collection of children's books at Shady. And the bookmobiles are a force unto themselves in terms of their juvenile collection. So it's great to have a broad collection that you can house in multiple places. Storage is always an issue. The hard part is not being able to be there every day and see what's going on and be able to jump in at a moment's notice to help because I love being able to do that and I can't. Raleigh County has probably the most active bookmobile service of any library system in the state. In fact, we're sitting here in the bookmobile garage mm -hmm. uh, talking about uh, uh, branches and bookmobiles. Uh, tell me about your 
Bookmobile service? Bookmobile service began in Raleigh County before library service began in Raleigh County. It grew out of the depression and as part of the New Deal, we were given a book wagon with a donkey <laughs> that pulled books around the community to deliver them on a monthly basis to different neighborhoods. And two years after that service started, they organized and said, now we need a library. And here we are almost 100 years later. You come a long way from the days of having a, a mule pulling a wagon. Absolutely. <laughs> now we have two bookmobiles and they service every school in Raleigh County as well as nursing homes, daycare centers, and communities that request them. How does a bookmobile programming differ from what you do at the main library and the branches? With the bookmobile, you have to design programs that can take place on the bookmobile or right outside the bookmobile. You don't have the space. So that's always a challenge, but my staff has more than risen to that challenge every year. And their summer reading, they will see upwards of 500 children a week and have them involved in a summer reading program. And I bet you it is a, uh, a big day at the schools when the bookmobile arrives. It's the happiest day, I think, for the kids, <laughs> maybe not the happiest for the teachers, but you have children, parents, grandparents, and even in some cases, great-grandparents who remember the bookmobile coming to their school in Raleigh County. Do the bookmobiles have their own inventory? Absolutely, they have to. They have two of everything, one for each bus, so they're never short. How difficult is that to manage? It's not. The branch manager of the bookmobile, Amy Smith, she has a budget just like the others and she selects for her community and just like they do. Bookmobiles in Raleigh County, as you mentioned, have been here a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, how important do you feel they are to the community? I think they are a great outreach to a population who doesn't have the ability to come to the library on their own. It was a very hard time for us when the Marsh Fork Library had to close due to a loss in population and attendance. And we were able to still supplement that community because we have bookmobiles. Amy, we've been talking about programming and branches and bookmobiles. What's your vision for the future of library service in Raleigh County? I want there to be more library service. I would love to have larger libraries in all of my branches. I would love to have extended hours at all of my branches. And I would dearly love to put a second story here at Beckley. We're always running out of space and it really impedes our growth. Amy, thanks for your time today. We really Thank appreciate you. it. <laughs> we'll be back with more on Libraries Today right after this. Share your heart. Share your love. Make a shelter pet part of your world. They say you can't judge a book by its cover, but I think you can judge a library by its programming. The role of public libraries in today's communities is as important as ever. By offering a mix of programs that appeal to children, teens, and adults, a public library can be a vital part of how its community grows and thrives. According to a 2015 Pew survey, almost two-thirds of adult Americans say that closing their local library would have a major impact on their community. Libraries have always been a place for the community to gather. And with programming like the kind the Raleigh County Public Library provides, they promise to stay that way for a long time to come. I'd like to thank my guests for being on today's show. Raleigh County Library Director Amy Stover and librarians Carrie Burns and Beth Mills. I'm Stan Howe. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Libraries Today.